Jesus said, I will build my church. And church is a community. Church is a group of God's people who worship God, who love God, who love one another. That's a church. Uh, church is not uh, just in its uh, building as such. Uh, yes, a place where we gather together to worship uh, is a church. We can call it a church. Yes, it is a church. But it is not just in the building. Just by having a building or just by constructing um, a building in the shape or an appearance of a church, don't make it a church automatically or is not the real church. The real church are its people, the people of God. We together, we are the church. The Bible says we are the body of Christ. We are the church of the living God. And so without us, a building is just a building. A building has no life in it. But it's the people who have life. It's the community of God's people who come together and who do life together, who journey in this life together, uh, are truly God's uh, church. And uh, to say a community, to describe a community a little more, a group of people who live in the same place or have a particular characteristic in common is normally called as a community. A, a people who have a, a, a same or a particular characteristic in common. We are people who have such particular beliefs, practices, uh, which are common for us. The Bible is common for us. We all come on this uh, common ground or the common denominator we all stand on uh, is the Word of God and who God is as people who believe in God, who love God. Um, as, uh, as the ones who come in the name of the Lord are welcome. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, we become community. Wherever we go, we might um, be in Africa, we might be in London, we might be in Sydney, or we might be, um, you know, in, uh, in Bihar, you know, we can be anywhere. But we, when we know that we are with a group of people who uh, follow the Lord, who are disciples of Jesus, who are children of God, who love God, who love one another, we become a community. We become part of the community. Hallelujah. Wherever we go, wherever we may be, uh, we are still part of a community. And that's why, while we have people uh, here with us, as we, all of us together, if we look at each other, uh, we are all from different backgrounds. We are all from different cultures. Uh, although we probably, yes, we are all Indians. Um, but yet, we all have our own subcultures uh, from which we come from, we hail from. Uh, we have different, uh, you know, uh, way of doing things. We have different languages we speak. We have uh, different um, uh, taste buds, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of foods that we like. Um, uh, I mean, you know, we, 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 we have all the differences of, uh, you know, being hailing from different backgrounds and all of that. Some come from Christian, uh, traditional Christian background, some come from um, a non Christian family background. But we once we wash by the blood of Jesus, once we come into the covenant, once we make a covenant with the Lord in the waters of baptism, and we uh, accept Him into our lives, we become part of the community of God's people. Hallelujah. We become one body. We become one in spirit. Uh, there is so much of um, love. There is so much of an identity of being one together uh, that we are no different uh, from each other. And... Uh, and, and so we have someone come from Yirkar, uh, who, uh, you know, who's from a very different uh, situation where we live in a concrete jungle and they live in a real jungle, um, you know, but we all have uh, one uh, community here because we all love Jesus and we love serving Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In a moment, we click with one another. Why? Because... We are a community. We are fellow citizens with God's people. This is God-made thing. This is not a man-made stuff. Man did not invent church. A bishop did not invent a church. A church is not uh, run for the sake of making money. And it's not a business thing. It's God's church. It's God-instituted institution. Hallelujah. Praise God. And God's intention for us is that we should be together as community of God's people. And uh, 
God exalts us. And Jesus prayed for us. And he prayed for this community. Uh, even before he died on the cross. In John's Gospel, chapter number 17, you read from verse 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe, who will believe in me through their message. John 17, 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So, now he prayed for the disciples, the twelve who were with him. And then he's praying for those who will believe in Jesus through the message that the disciples are going to proclaim. And we are also pe those people who have heard the message. From where? From the disciples proclaiming the message and Thomas came to India and preached in Chennai and Kerala and, and the gospel spread all over the world through the twelve disciples and, and has come. And so we have believed through their message which they have preached. Jesus didn't come preach to us directly, but it's from the disciples and from generation to generation. The faith has been handed down and the message of the gospel has been proclaimed and we have heard and we believe that. So Jesus is praying for people like us. Exactly. My prayer is not for them alone, that meaning for the disciples alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Verse 21, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So God is calling us into this household experience, in this uh, community of uh, God's people, to be one in this community. And Jesus prayed, it was his plan that we would come to complete unity. Um, unity does not necessarily uh, imply uniformity. There's a difference between uniformity and unity. Uh, this is not calling for a uniform civil court. Uh, you know, but this is unity. We are all different. We are gifted in different ways. We have different personalities. We have different likes and dislikes. We have different temperaments. We are made differently. We look different. Um, some of us are tall. Some of us are not so tall. Uh, some of us are uh, very lean uh, and some of us are not so lean. Um, I mean, let's not use those negative terms like not so lean. Uh, you know, some of us um, are um, uh, dark skinned, some of us are, um, uh, you know, colorless, uh, no, sorry, um, <laughs> lighter. Wheatish, um, not riceish, right? only wheatish, they say. Uh, so, so we all look different. We all are different. We have different styles of doing things. We have different ways of expressing ourselves. We have different ways of how we carry ourselves, how we communicate with people. We have different expressions that we use. We are all individually different. Right from um, our thumbprints, Everything is different, you know. Some of us have uh, nice long noses. Some of us uh, have little different ones, um, you know. So we are all different, isn't it? Uh, some of us have excess hair. Some of us uh, <laughs> are losing along the way. And so, with all of that, we are all to call to come into complete unity. Hallelujah. To unity is to, uh, you know, love one another in the midst of, uh, you know, our differences, in the midst of our disagreements, in the midst of our different expressions. Or some of us like the way others talk, or some of us like some people who talk like the way we talk, or the way we expect others to talk, and some of us, we don't like the way some others behave or some others talk, um, you know. So with all those differences, our likes, preferences, dislikes, and all that, God is calling us into community of coming together into perfect, complete unity. Without unity, there cannot be community. Do you see that, that the word unity is part of the word community itself? C-O-N-N-U-N-I-T-Y. The last five letters, alphabets, are part of the word community. Isn't it interesting? 
then there will and he ultimately his goal is that we will be built together that we will may be built up together uh, joined together to be built up together as a holy temple unto the lord to be a dwelling in you know uh, that we together will be a dwelling place where god will live by his spirit where god's spirit will move uh, you see in acts of 1 um, uh, in verse 14 they all joined together and came together and prayed about 120 people came together in unity and in 2 acts 2 and verse 1 says uh, when the day of pentecost had fully come um, they were all together in one accord in one place and they were praying and they were worshiping and that's where the holy spirit suddenly came and showed up and he filled the whole house and he filled everybody seated there and they were all filled with the holy spirit the bible says in verse 4 and acts 2 4 they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance and so you see the manifestation of god uh, the the revelation of god or god manifest god shows up god comes and dwells in among people who come together in unity where two three gathered in my name there i am in the midst he said in acts 13 verses 1 to 3 you find prophets and teachers there in uh, the church uh, came together and they were praying together they were worshiping together they were fasting and seeking the face of the lord and suddenly the holy spirit said set apart to me barnabas and saul for the work for which i have called them you see the holy spirit speaking invading that place speaking to them giving them direction you see always wherever they came together in unity god was moving in their midst god wants to build us together uh, into complete unity that will that so that we will be a biblical community now you have uh, several communities in the world today you have uh, very popularly what is being talked about much uh, you know in the social media space and all that is the gay community uh, i mean their community happens for different reasons they come together for uh, now this is not that kind of a community that god is calling us for but this is a biblical community that god is calling us to live in and live by and there are uh, certain aspects of who we are as a community uh, eliminating those things we will not remain a biblical community and so with this morning we're going to look at what are those things that make a biblical community who are we identifying ourselves together as god's people together not stand alone and today we see increasingly people separating themselves from a biblical community from a household of god of god's people separating themselves and saying oh uh, for me i just pray to god for my needs uh, whether i pray at home or pray in church doesn't matter so i pray at home i'm very comfortable in the four walls of my house and uh, i'm so happy i have some good christian television and hear some good messages and the preachers i like i hear uh, because in those churches i go to i don't like the preachers and so uh, let me just like the preachers that i like and let me just read the books that i like to read and i just read my bible i pray i mean i'm just a very quiet person no very quiet spirituality i'm very pious you know i very walk so softly that even the floor below me doesn't hurt itself nor my feet uh, i'm very very spiritual holy a uh, pious uh, very nice quiet goody goody uh, christian uh, i don't go to churches you know all the politics and this uh, all that is uh, they talk big but that's just rubbish because the scripture is calling us into a community life god wants us to be part of a people of god we are fellow citizens of god's household nothing wrong in praying alone it's important that we pray alone that's about our personal relationship with the lord that's important that we read the bible every day alone yes it's important but yet at the same time he wants us to be together in relationship with one another where we will be together to be able to build each other up we cannot get built up unless we have one another that's a biblical model that's you, you know a lot of people won't like this you know uh, calling people to come together in unity uh, with other fellow god's people they don't like it because they don't understand biblical principles only when you function according to biblical principles things will go all right in our lives everything will fall in its place and so it's important for us to study what jesus has meant his church to be and we who are called to be his church we who are called to be his body we can say that yes i am a christian i want to go to heaven but i don't like this church 
I'm sorry. You're going to be with his body in heaven. So you better get to like his body right here on earth so that you don't have trouble in heaven. Hello. Are you hearing me? They don't like his body here. This is his body washed by his blood. And we have no right to despise his body. We don't have any right to say, I don't belong to his body. If we say that, we don't belong to his body. We will separate ourselves. So it's important that we do not have this kind of a, a spirit that is so independent and increasingly it is so in the world today because the world is calling for more and more of independent life. My private space, don't disturb me. Even if I've messed up, it's my mess. You don't mess with me. You hear what I'm saying? That's the kind of spirit. That's the kind of attitude. That's the kind of defiance with which people live today. You know, you have no right over me. Who are you to say what I want to do? What I want to do? It's all about my life. It's about me. You know, what is called as metopia. You know, it's all about me. Now, that's the kind of lifestyle the people of the world live in, and that's the kind of culture we are living in. That's the kind of culture that's getting uh, propagated. But God is calling us into unity, community. Hallelujah. That's who, uh, that's what the, the, that's why he put us together in church. That's why he started the family first. Right at the time of creation, he made Eve for Adam and, and put them together as family and gave them children. He, the first institution that God ever established was a family. And as a representation of the family, he, he uses that as an analogy to describe how the church is. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 5, you see that the church is called like the bridegroom and the bride and, 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 and Jesus and the church. That's how our relationship has to be. And so it's important that we come to terms with this aspect to understand that we are part of a biblical community. And it's important that we stay in this biblical community, that we uh, experience community like that. By that, what we mean is where we are in relationship with one another. When we are primarily in a relationship with God and we are, and, and, and secondly, along with that, we are in a relationship with one another. And it's only in this relationship where we really grow. It's only in this relationship where we really overcome. It's in this relationship where we stand shoulder to shoulder with one another for each other's needs, casting our burdens upon one another and praying and, uh, you know, uh, helping and, and uh, encouraging and strengthening and, uh, you know, uh, bringing about uh, true strength and, uh, it, and, and bringing forth our talents and gifts and using them for the blessing of one another. This is how God meant the church of God to be, whereby he will come and dwell in, by his spirit. And so th there are some common factors or specific characteristics, particular characteristics of a biblical community, which we're going to look at. Three of them, number one, is a believing community. A biblical community of God's people is a believing community. Basically, what brings us together, the common factor, is that we are believers. What do we believe in? We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Word of God. Uh, we believe that in Trinity. We believe in uh, salvation through Jesus. We believe uh, that He is the Son of God. He died and raised, uh, was risen from the dead. We believe that through Him there is eternal life and forgiveness of sins. We believe that through Him that we, uh, you know, and that he's going to come back as a judge of the living and the dead. And we believe that he established his church and he wants us to be part of this church. We believe in him and all the things that, those things that we believe, those are the things that bind us together. You look at John 17, the passage we have just now read, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. It is those who will believe in him. And so primarily, where the common denominator starts is that we believe in Jesus. We believe in the message of the gospel. We believe that our lives have been transformed through the power of the gospel. We are believers. That's, just, that's a common denominator where we begin from. And, and there he prays, let them be one. Let them come together in perfect uh, community. As, he, as the Father and the Son, they are in one with each other. Uh, and so God is calling us to complete unity. And you see, um, in Second Corinthians, in contrast with a biblical community and a believing community, and what we should refrain from, 
to stay in a biblical community. You see in 2 Corinthians and chapter number 6 and verse 14 to chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. This is the ancient plan of God that he will be our God, we shall be his people and he will dwell among us. That's been his plan right from the beginning. That's why he created man, Adam and Eve. So that he would come in the cool of the day and he would come fellowship with his creation. He was not coming to, you know, come and eat some apples in the garden. He came to fellowship with Adam and Eve. And he comes. And, 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 and then because of the fall of man, he could not remain with them. He sent them out of the garden. And then you see that all through history, God is revealing himself by choosing people, individuals. And then through a nation, Israel, he dwells among them so that in, among the people he will dwell and he will show themselves that he is God and they shall be his people that he will dwell among them and you see all through the people of Israel several times going away from him because they fall short, uh, fell short of God's standards and expectations and so God could not be present with them and he had to correct them by sending them uh, punishment he said he had to send them uh, as uh, you know captives to foreign nations and so that they will turn around and return to him but yet with loving kindness and great compassion, he brings them back and he wants to dwell among them. He continues to reveal himself progressively all through the Old Testament, through the law and the prophets. You see that God is revealing himself, that he wants to dwell among his people and through the nation of Israel to reveal to the world that he is God. And there you see that Jesus comes and he dies. The full revelation of who God is in the person of Jesus where he comes and he dies on the cross and he risen, rises from the dead and he brings about this God's the body of Christ that because uh, you know that his intention right from the beginning was that we will be his people he will be our God he will dwell among us he comes and he reveals himself to the church he establishes he has a, a plan for the world that Christ's greatest plan for the world is the church so that he will come and dwell among them and so he wants us to come together in complete unity as people who believe in him and so, as believers, as a believing community, which is essentially the biblical foundations of a biblical community, where we cannot be with a community of unbelievers, where we cannot uh, have fellowship with unbelievers and, and be part, not being part of a believing community, but being part of an unbelieving community. Yes, uh, we can probably have... Uh, you know, online communities and WhatsApp groups and all of that for practical reasons of work and, and study and so many other things. Uh, pr yes, of course, we work and we live in this world and we are surrounded with people who do not believe in Jesus. Uh, it's not that we can we have to alienate ourselves, go and sit up in some mountain uh, where there are no unbelievers around us. But that's not what God is calling us to do. But what he's saying here is that your fellowship should be with believers. Your identity should be with believers, with fellow God's people, not with unbelievers. There are people here to, you know, in the world today, in, the, in churches, who, who are believers, who believe in Jesus, who accepted Christ. But yet, when they go out there in the world, they behave like an unbeliever. They don't want to identify themselves that I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. They don't want to recognize themselves with other people who are also believing in Jesus. They are ashamed of identifying themselves to be a Christian. They are ashamed to carry the Bible. They are ashamed to even say that I am a Christian. This is what I believe in. Leave alone sharing the gospel with the non-Christians. I am not talking about witnessing to other people, telling the other people about Jesus. But to even say that I am a Christian, I believe in this. I don't believe in that. People are afraid. It's important that we don't, you know, shy away or we don't, you know, subdue or we don't put those things under the carpet and say, no, I'm not going to show myself to be a Christian. I don't want people to know who, what I am. I neither want to show myself as a non-Christian nor do I, I want to show myself as a Christian. Let me kind of play it very safe, neutral. Cat on the wall. And we Indians are very good at that. Do you like coffee? Uh, yeah. 
Is it yes or no? Yes is this, no is this. That's the way you shake the head when you say yes or no. But we in India, we say, uh, okay. uh, can you get this done? Uh, yes or no? No. You can't really make out. You see, that's, that's where the problem is when it comes to our faith also. Because we are still saying this when you are in the world. Are you a Christian? Are you, not, are you not a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? You don't believe? It's neither yes nor no. That kind of cat on the wall situation. You know, playing it very safe. Being a neutral person. So afraid. So shy. So ashamed. But you know, there is a clear distinction between those who belong to Christ and those who don't belong to Christ. Those who believe in Jesus and those who don't believe in Jesus. We can't go and act like saying we also believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus also. Not that, not that kind of disposition. It's important that we have a clear conviction. Are you a believer or not a believer? Are you a Christian or not a Christian? Be bold to say, I am a Christian. I am a believer. I believe in Jesus. Be bold to say, be courageous to say, I go to church. They are afraid to say. People are afraid to say because they, they, are, they are afraid of what their peers will think like about them. They are afraid of how they get, probably get, might get mocked in office or among friends in school or in college. And so they are afraid to say, I am a believer. I go to church. I think it's important that we really identify ourselves who we are. A person who is strongly rooted in a biblical community of God's church, of God's household, will have the boldness, the courage to say, I am a believer. It will be very firm, it will be very clear on the fact that, yes, I'm, I'm part of this believing community. That's where my identity is. My identity is not, does not come from unbelievers. It's not about by staying neutral. Amen? Hallelujah. So never, never uh, associate ourselves or fellowship in such a way where we gain our identity or we have our identity with people who are not believers. It's important that we have a clear, sure identity that I belong to Christ, that I'm part of a believing community, that I'm part of a biblical community. Hallelujah. Be it at workplace, be it at school, at college, being it, be it with neighborhood, be it also among relatives who are unsaved. Amen. They may not be believers. They may not like you going to church. But be bold to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. We have too many people who do not have a backbone. Who can't stand up for their faith. And it's important that we really, really establish this clearly well within our hearts and our minds and have a clear uh, decision made and have our identity with the people of God. Not that we should hate unbelievers. Not that we should not meet with them or fellowship with them. Not that we should not visit them or have them in our homes. Not that we should not associate with them. The Bible says that we are in the world but we are not of the world. We live among people in a society that's um, corrupted and it's so important that we have our identities very clear. Values have changed. Values are different. We don't, have, we don't share common values with people out there in the world. We don't share common values with people who are not believers. We don't. Oh, God of the Old Testament is also your God. And so we are all like brothers only. That's a myth. You know what I'm talking about? Our God of the Old Testament is only your God whom you worship. We all come from the same father, Abraham. And so we are all brothers. No, we are not. Their God is not God Jehovah. That's an evil spirit from the pits of hell that they worship. That's not Jehovah God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we can't, we can't find any uh, common identities. And we, in fact, if you think you have a lot of similarities with uh, people of other things, other beliefs. No, it's not true. Here we have a God who gave his blood, but there is a God who takes blood of people. 
So we don't have common values at all with the people of the world. We can't. Even how good a person may be or how philanthropic a person may be, how generous, how great. He might have even written his whole, uh, you know, all of his property and everything that belonged to him, you know, written of his will to a charitable organization. Might have done great charity to the world. But we, unless a person believes in Jesus and experiences salvation through the name of Jesus, through the message of the gospel, we do not have a common identity at all. Amen. Is that clear for us? Values are different. What we live by is different. Immorality, profanity, injustice, survival of the fittest, defiant spirit, disrespect for the law, rules, regulations, dishonesty, lack of sincerity, lack of loyalty, lack of clean transactions are becoming common behavioral patterns. Increasingly, those are very becoming common. People entertain and uh, uh, can tolerate more uh, and more of uh, sexually explicit images and uh, messages on television or on media. They can tolerate them more, but they can't tolerate uh, a religious difference or somebody saying something against uh, being gay. Those things are tolerated more. That's how a culture changes slowly it, and it's changing in our nation slowly, step by step. You have chartered accountants who give you uh, wrong suggestions of how you can manage your taxes and your uh, wealth. They, they teach you how to evade tax and for which we pay a fee, professional fee, because they teach you how to cheat, how to cheat the government. You see, values are different. Values have changed. It's not about doing things sincerely, honestly, and being loyal, and all of those things have lost its value. Being sincere, loyal, truthful, faithful, have all gone out of the window. And so, we as a community of believing God's people, we are different, they are different. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody say, they are different. Yeah. Amen. We as a believing community have different set of values that we live by. Anyone believing, anyone in a, who believes in biblical values are looked down these days. Anyone who upholds marriage between a man and a woman, if you go to the West and talk about marriage only between a man and a woman, you'll be looked down, you'll be looked like some kind of a ancient alien who has just arrived. Homosexuality, abortion are increase, increasingly tolerated and practiced. Anything you say against those things in some Western countries can get you jailed. Can get you jailed. A woman, King Davis, was jailed because she refused to sign the papers for gay marriage. She got jailed. Who should get jailed? The homosexuals are the one who refuses to sign. You see, totally the worst. You have to be politically correct to survive. That's the order of the day increasingly. But that's where our identity should be drawn from biblical values. And unless we recognize that I am part of the believing community of God's people. I don't belong to this world. I belong to God. And I belong to a community of God's people who base their foundations on biblical principles and the teachings of God's word that have been handed down from Christ and through the apostles, through the power of the Holy Spirit to us. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. You see, Apostle, uh, you see Peter preaching there and he's warning the Jews there. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, he says, With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. If, if he thought that the generation 2000 years back was corrupt, just imagine Peter comes down, Phoenix Mall, what would he think? 
about this generation? I don't know. A believing community who gets persecuted for standing up for what they believe in. In your office, in your school, in your college. If you say what is the truth, what is real, what is good, what is right, what is biblically right. You get persecuted. That's what happened in the early church also. The Acts of the, Acts of the Apostles, verse chapter number 12. We read from verse 1 to 7. Acts 12, 1 to 7. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. You see, because this please persecuting the church, which Herod did, please the Jews. And so he starts persecuting the church even more. And he put uh, James, the brother of John, to death by the sword. And he saw it pleased the Jews. He, he got hold of Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse 4, after arresting him, he put him to, in prison, handing over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Hallelujah. You see, the power of the biblical community, of the believing community, you might get persecuted, you might get ridiculed, you might get mocked for what you believe in. You might not be able to associate and fully agree with an unbelieving community that is around you. You may be challenging them. You may be confronting them. You may be disagreeing with them. You may not go the wrong way by doing things the way they do. You may not go by the values that they have. And the, value, the systems by which they operate, you, you play a different game according to different rules. But you know what? When, even though they were persecuted, even though they were scattered, even though they were, uh, you know, they were uh, taken to be as offen uh, an offense to them, and they were put in prison, you know what happens? An angel of the Lord comes and sets them free. The believing community is a powerful community. Hallelujah. Miracles happen. I said miracles happen. Hallelujah. A believing community is not a powerless community. It might look like we are so insignificant. It might look like we are so weak. It might look like we are so small. It might look like we are so, you know, helpless. Where if we declare what we believe in and what we stand for, we might get persecuted. We might be looked down. We might be, 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 we might be uh, deprived of promotions and, and good opportunities and credit for what we do. We might suffer injustice, but a believing community is always a powerful community where heaven is in charge of this community. Hallelujah. Somebody shout an amen. amen. Hallelujah. Heaven is in charge of this community. We are a powerful people of God. We are not weak. We might be a minority. But with Jesus, we are a majority. Amen. Hallelujah. We can be scattered, persecuted, but miracles will happen. Even, even prison doors open up for this believing community. Hallelujah. Praise God. Never give up what we believe in. Number two, quickly, we are a learning community. As we, as God's people, as a community of God's household, we are primarily the common factor, the common denominator that we come together by is that we are a biblical, believing community. And secondly, that we are a learning community. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we follow the Master, we follow His teachings. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 to 47, we all know a very familiar, familiar passage there. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The Holy Spirit continues to teach through the apostles. Jesus continues to do his work in the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here through the apostles, they were teaching the people of God there. And you know in John 17, 26, that the Bible says that the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to all truth. 
In chapter 16, verse 13 to 15, you read that. In Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Jesus is giving us a great commission. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus has been teaching the disciples all through his three and a half years many things. And he's telling the apostles now, now I commission you to go and not just preach the gospel and baptize people, but also teach them everything I have commanded you. And God is wanting us to learn all that he has taught us, all that has been taught by Jesus, all that has been taught through the Old Testament, all that has been taught by the apostles, through the Holy Spirit, he wants us to keep learning. A disciple is a learner, is a student. Teach them all that I have commanded you, that they may obey. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. You see, in the early church, the first century church, that's what the, the apostles did. They went, preached the gospel, they discipled people, and they established them in the faith by teaching them, by staying with them and teaching the people who are new to the faith. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 19 to 26. Acts 11, 19 to 26. Now those who have been scattered by the persecution in, connected, in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch in telling the message only to Jews. Acts 11, 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Syria went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Yes, praise God, they preached the gospel, people believed in Jesus, they were gathered together in churches. In verse 22, news of this recent years of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. This was in the city of Antioch. But the church at Jerusalem was the headquarters there, the apostles were there, and the news reaches there, and here the, that the gospel has gone to the Greeks, not just to the Jews, but now to the Greeks. And so there's a progression of the gospel. And so Barnabas is, uh, Barnabas is sent there when the news reached the church in Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, verse 23, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Verse 24, he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Verse 24. And verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Verse 26, when he found him, he brought him in to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. You see them preaching the gospel, gathering together into a church, as a church, and then they are taught what they should follow, how they should live this Christian life. So a, a church, a body of Christ, is a learning community. It's not just a believing community, it's also a community where the word of God is being taught biblical principles are taught how to live life has been taught the, the ways of Christ are taught what has been handed down through the apostles are being taught it's important that we have a learning posture as we are together as God's people not just believe not just stand up for the faith not just to make a difference not just to live by the biblical values but also to continue to learn we learn for a lifetime Amen. We never cease learning. Learning happens for a whole lifetime. And the moment we stop learning, we stop growing. The more we are willing to learn, the more we will grow. Hallelujah. And so they taught a whole year there. In chapter 18 also you read in verse um, 9 to 11. Chapter 18. Verses 9 to 11. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. And so Saul stayed for a year and a half. Teaching them the word of God. At Corinth. They had preached the gospel. Believers were gathered together. And they were teaching the church at Corinth. For a whole year and a half. <coughs> It's important. You see all through in the New Testament, you see the epistles and the letters of the Apostle Paul. You see teaching continuously. A uh, lot of teaching is given. You see in Second Timothy, uh, sorry, First Timothy, and chapter number three. First Timothy three, and verse number fourteen and fifteen. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that 
If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. When Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, I hope to come to you soon. I am writing these instructions to you so that if I am delayed in coming to you, Timothy, that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, how they ought to live which is the church of the living God, and he goes on to say, the pillar and the foundation of truth. Truth is found where? Where is truth found? Yes, in Jesus. But how? Today, in the world, truth is found in the church. We are the guardians of the truth. We are the proclaimers of the truth. We are the practitioners of the truth. Hallelujah. We are the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Truth is found in God's people, in the community of God's people. We find falsehood in the world. But the truth, universal truths are proclaimed and practiced among God's people. For which we need to know how we ought to live. Timothy, how you need to conduct God's household. How you ought to live in God's family. That's why I'm writing to you 1 Timothy. You see the intent of the letter. The intent of the content. We read the content. But we also need to learn to find the intent of the content. With what intention, for what purpose was Paul writing to Timothy? He's writing Timothy. And you see all through he's giving instructions. He's giving instructions. He's giving instructions. To Timothy, how you should be. You see in chapter number 4, verse 11. 1 Timothy 4, 11. Command and teach these things. Verse 6, chapter 6 and verse number 2. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them who they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because they benefit from the thing, from their service are believers and dear to them. These are things you are to teach and to urge them. These are things you should teach and urge. All through chapter 5, you see exhortations given about how uh, widows have to be taken care of. How elders have to be taken care of. How slaves have to behave with their masters. Within God's household, how we ought to behave, how we ought, we ought to live, how we ought to function, all these things are taught. And he says, teach and urge them in chapter 6 and verse number 2, last phrase. Keep teaching. Keep putting things into practice, he says. Second Timothy, chapter number 1 and verse 13. When you, what you heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you, guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying to Timothy, what I have taught you, keep it as a pattern of sound teaching. Keep it, follow it. In chapter 2, verse 14 to 18, keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling with, about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who handles the word of truth correctly. Where we should be able to open up scriptures and be able to interpret scriptures rightly and apply them rightly to our lives and be able to draw principles for life right away. Because there were a lot of false teachings in those days and even as now. There is false teaching. There are false teachings that are going around even today. And so to be able to stand up against these wrong teachings. So he's telling Timothy, be a person who will be well equipped, a workman, work hard on the word of God, read it well, understand it well. A workman who does not need to be ashamed as one who will be approved by God. Why? Because there are a lot of false teachings. Verse 16, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. This was a false teaching. Havenus and Philetus were involved in this. They were preaching and saying that the resurrection had already taken place. That's what they were preaching. Verse 18, you see that? They say that the resurrection has already taken place and destroyed the faith of some. And so Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, hold on to the teaching. Learn the teaching well. Do the teaching well. Teach people rightly. Be a workman who will be well equipped. Every reader of God's word is an interpreter. Every one of us who reads scripture, interpret it for ourselves. It's not only those who preach who interpret the word of God. Every one of us who reads scripture are interpreters. We interpret it for ourselves. We understand it in a certain way. And apply it to our lives. 
So it's important that we are very diligent when we give ourselves to learning, good learning. Amen. Have a learning posture, having a have a desire to know more. Come regularly to the church so that you can learn and grow consistently. You know, sometimes it's like uh, some people are like this. They go to one church one Sunday, another church another Sunday, here and there, everywhere, nothing wrong. All churches are God's churches. But sometimes they are like church tourists. You know, tourists go place to place. Church tourists. Would you send your child one day to his BOA school, another day to Louis Leo school, another day to Bain school, another day to Anna University? Huh? One day to corporation school. Would you sing here and there? You think they will learn? The Bible says that the, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Be rooted, grounded in one community of God's people where you can grow well, where you can learn well. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15 that God gives the shepherds according to his own heart, who will teach us with wisdom and understanding. And so it's important that you recognize, identify where God has placed you and stay rooted and be regular and consistent in that place and be committed to the people of God in that place, wherever it is. I'm not saying that we are the right church or other churches are wrong, no. All of God's churches. But where God has placed you, where God leads you, you pray, you ask Lord, who is the shepherd for me? Which is the community of God's people I should be plugged into? And have a learning posture where you are there every Sunday, every service, every meeting. So that every time the word of God is being preached and taught, that you are hearing it, you're listening to it, you're, you're, you're absorbing it, then you will see growth happen. Why? Because there are a lot of false teachings. You go here and there, you can get distorted. One person will say like this, one person will say something else, the opposite of that. And your faith can get shipwrecked. Second Peter. You see, having a learning posture, even Peter is encouraging uh, the believers to do the same, to have a learning posture because of the false teachings that are going around. Chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. Some of us are trying hard for 2 Peter. Go back from the maps, Revelations, and you'll soon hit Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. <laughs> Dear friends, this is how this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders. To stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Everybody say wholesome thinking. Wholesome thinking. thinking. Not some partial thinking. That's why some people get stuck with. They only think about grace. They only think about grace. They only talk about grace. They only preach about grace. Grace, 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 grace. But wholesome thinking. All of scriptures have to be able to be thought through. Reading it well, thinking it through, hearing it, that helps growth. Where we have balanced thinking, not one-sided, not building on one aspect of the truth. Some people build on one aspect of the truth. They look at the whole Bible with the perspective of blessing. That the whole Bible was written only for some blessing. So everywhere they find a word like blessing, oh, they would get hold of it. And somebody has also come out with the blessing Bible. Where they have got hold of all the blessings. I believe there are 53 kinds of blessings. I don't know where they got it from. 58? Oh wow, you got the numbers right. Blessing Bible. No, pulling scripture verses out of its context and putting all those blessing verses together. You pull scriptures out of its context and read them. You can say whatever you want to say using those verses. Words have meanings in sentences. Sentences have meanings in paragraphs. So when you read scripture, read the whole thing 
in what context it's been written in. We all know the very famous verse that we quote very often. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. All things? Question mark. Can you do all things? You know in what context it says? I can do all things in, through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. It talks about where Paul is talking about how he is, he knows how to have everything and also have nothing. It's in the context of contentment that whether I have excess or I have nothing, that I can do all things. I can be rich, I can be poor also. I can have much, I can have less also. But in all things, I can do all these things. I can do through Christ who strengthens me. I can face all of this in life. I can be contented whether I have much or I have less. I can stay contented. These things I can do through Christ. You see, you pull that verse out of its context, you can have give a totally new meaning to it. You hear what I'm saying? And so it's important we have wholesome thinking. Where can we get wholesome thinking unless we learn? We need to learn. Brother, sister, we all are on a learning journey. And we need to have a learning posture, a desire to learn, and be committed to learn. Amen?